Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 888. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 29th, 2024. All right, audience, all you people way out there, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. I may sound a little foggy, foggy, whatever allergy people sound like. Uh, Something hit me here. I slept in this morning. I feel a little congested. I'm apologizing for that up front. And this episode, I'll talk about other people's apologies. I'm talking about mine right now. So just to let you know what's going on. quick update here we are leaving maryland and slowly heading to florida we'll be down there uh, before election day so hopefully we arrive November 4th we will be stopping on wednesday in charleston because there's an event there the installation of the new archbishop for the acna and his name is going to be steve wood and i'll be there live streaming so you can uh, watch the uh installation of steve wood on anglican tv therefore Hey, Kevin, how do I do that? Now is your chance. If you've never subscribed, to subscribe. Right there, there's that little red box. You click it, and boom, up pops a bell. You click that bell, and you are subscribed, and you will get instant notifications uh, for the installation and any future episodes. Also, if you see us on Facebook or YouTube, click that little thumbs up. That helps us with free advertising. Uh, if you want to really tell us what you think, we, we appreciate that. You go to the comment sections. If you really are sick and tired of looking at our faces on screen, this comes in podcast form. And you can just listen to our, our silky voices uh, in that. You'll find the link to the podcord, podcord, podcast in the show notes on our YouTube channel. George, how are you doing this week? As people can see, I'm out of uniform. Ooh, ooh. I've been up since 5 a.m. working and preparing for the bishop's visit. Uh-huh. Uh, just all sorts of exciting stuff. Finishing up the confirmation classes, baptismal preparation. Um, I'm working on a paper for the bishop that I want to present to him on uh, exorcism. And I'm also preparing for the bishop a... Uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a genealogy chart. His apostolic success. Oh, cool. Succession. All right. Nice. Going all the way back to the uh, 12 disciples and the apostles. And uh, the uh, Bishop of Central Florida can trace his laying on of hands back to two of the 12, uh, Peter and James. Now, who was his bishop? Who was his bishop? Uh, oh. John Howe was okay. his, uh, all right. uh, well, or the presiding bishop, uh, Michael Curry. Uh-huh. But uh, so cool. uh, try to get all these things done, things printed. Uh, we had I did a wedding on. Uh, I saw the pictures. Yeah, at funerals and uh, wedding, uh-huh. people are dying, people are getting married, uh-huh. and now I got baptisms. One of the wonderful things about a long-term pastorate is that you grow with people. Mm-hmm. So the girl I married uh, on Saturday, not the girl I married forty years ago. <laughs> 40. <laughs> uh, I've known her since she was 11, Mm. and she's uh, now getting married, and it was fun. I was the only male member of the bridal party who didn't have one of these walrus mustaches. The groom is a sergeant in the Air Force. He's an avionics tech, so he's going to be wealthy once he gets out because he's going to go to work for Boeing or somebody. He does electronics for these advanced planes, but all of his groomsmen were... uh, sergeants in the air force and you could tell because there was like two inches of skin above their ears then these well i i didn't know you could do this but then these mustaches that you know like they would wax to tips that go oh, okay sure feet. wow so you know it was just like i felt like like a child around these big boys with, but they were all sergeants too so they would have scared me anyway if i were yeah, that's it yeah it, i mean it, it it's snowbird season I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, people like George and I live in Florida because we don't like winters. And you can see my, my beard is coming in thicker because of the, it's cold outside now. So, different times. It was, it was 70 degrees when I woke up this morning. <laughs> so I had to put a sweater on. So I'm still cold. 
Uh-huh. We're so spoiled. All right, let's move on to the news. Uh, the biggest news happens right after we record a show. Uh, always some news breaks Friday. This is the Friday breaking story. Justin Welby rejects the Church of England teaching on marriage and human sexuality. There's actually two parts of the story. Let's cover the first part. He appeared on the show called The Rest is Politics. And he says all sexual activity should be within a committed relationship, whether it is straight or whether it is gay. And uh, boy, George, that's a departure from uh, 2,000 years of teaching, 6,000 years of uh, uh, history before that. Uh, with Judaism, I'm, I'm bewildered that uh, he's the leader of the Anglican Communion. So let, let, let's talk about this story. Well, the formal stance of the church is that sex uh, is within marriage only, and that marriage is faithful, exclusive, like long male and female. Mm -hmm. That's where sexual activity rightfully takes place. Premarital sex, no gay sex, no this or that. What is the desire of God to have families? Uh, To be fruitful and to multiply and give honor to Him. Um, But so, Weldy in his uh, Rest is Politics podcast, basically said, upended Christian doctrine as it's practiced in the Anglican world on sexual relations. Now, of course, it's a controversial topic. We've been fighting over this for a generation now, but it's not what Welby says it is. And there's immediate backlash, immediate backlash. the alliance which is the uh, grouping of sort of people on the conservative evangelical charismatic uh, side you know holy trinity brompton and Mm -hmm. church society and all these people responded the correct constitutional process has not been followed for determine for departing from current agreed doctrine or for a change of liturgy in other words welby is basically saying okay you know, gay marriage is fine, gay sex is fine, so long as you're faithful to your partner. But how long does that faithfulness last? Is it saying, okay, you can be a norm, you know, serial monogamy faithful at, at any one time? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, polygamy's out, according to Welby, but nothing else is. Well, what is a sign of a faithful long term relationship? Well, we that's why we have to use marriage as that. Uh, institution because I have a sign that I'm, I'm married. Uh, I have a wife, somebody who's uh, I've committed my life to. Um, she has a husband who's, who she's done the same for. Um, I don't know, George. There's so you know this brought an explosion. Yeah, and the alliance says if you're going to have de facto change of doctrine, we're going to have a de facto meaning in fact, not legal. If you're just going to change things without going through the process, we're going to change things and set up a new province within the Church of England for like-minded uh, people who believe in the uh, faith once received. Now, this prompted a formal statement written by lawyers or robots, one or the other. And it AI. was in the third person. Archbishop Justin Wobin was giving a personal view that reflects the position now held by himself, the Archbishop of York, and many other bishops regarding sexual intimacy. So he's throwing Stephen Cottrell under the bus and, as well. And it says he's been honest that his thinking has evolved over the years through much prayer and theological reflection. Notice what's missing. Biblical. Biblical. Bible. Yeah. He's been praying, church history. So he's asking, so he's asking <laughs> the Spirit to lead him Mm-hmm. but he's not anchoring it in the spirit theological reflection can mean whatever the hell you're thinking at the moment but the bible is absent from this but he continues and he now holds his view sincerely well i'm glad he thinks that he's being sincere so mm-hmm. does it mean that he's been insincere all these years what does that mean and it, yeah up and until it he also, this yeah and it reflects oh. his commitment to continue to welcome love and include lgbtq plus and I've read the entire thing. So bisexual, transgender, not just gay and lesbian, but the whole shebang, people more fully in the life of the church. This is antinomianism, you know, whatever floats your boat, pal. If you're happy and you know it, clap for Justin Welby. Yeah, all things being equal, this is what it looks like. 
you know. And here's here's that reality we have to live in right now. Uh, Justin Welby needs to look for a different job. If I were the CEO of Ford or Chevy or name, name the big car company, and I drove to work in a Tesla, and I said I like the Tesla, and after doing much soul-searching and research, I have discovered the Tesla to be a superior product than the Ford, uh, I would be out of a job that afternoon. And I would say the same needs to go for the heretic Justin Welby. Uh, this is this is heresy. This is Gnosticism. This is um, all things bad about putting a uh, person who doesn't have conviction in the office of Archbishop of Canterbury. So. To me, to me, it was struck very forcefully, you know, having just performed a wedding and read through the marriage liturgy and counseled a couple. Um, what's the point of the counseling? What's the point of the marriage liturgy? Uh, just so long as, you know, basically, Welby is blessing uh, shacking up or the hookup culture. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, so long as it's only two people, he's not uh, endorsing group sex, but that commitment, how long is that commitment? Is it lifelong? Doesn't say. That's what we say in marriage, it's lifelong. Now, is this a commitment for the weekend? Is this the commitment uh, for as long as you like the guy or girl? It, uh, but, but George, it's just I married, you know, I married, but I have a very good looking secretary and I can strike up a commitment with, with her now. A, a short-term intimacy, but it's intimate. And the thing is that Justin Welby is robbing people, robbing people of what should be the greatest gift in their life, which is their relationship with their spouse. I mean, I've been married for 40 years, and mm-hmm. I've had to work at it. It just doesn't happen. It's not like, oh, well, you know, it's not quite working, or, oh, oh, this year she's fat and ugly, or this year I'm dumb and stupid. My friends, you work through your problems, and what you find is that when Christ is at the center and you live according to God's will for your marriage, your marriage can be the best thing in your life. It certainly is in mine, is more important to me than my ordination, more important mm-hmm. to me than anything else, mm-hmm. save for my faith in Jesus Christ. But because of my faith in Jesus Christ, my marriage has been wonderful. And what <laughs> Welby is doing with this is racing after the spirit of the age which is looking for immediate short-term gratification i gotta be me i gotta be free yeah Uh, as frank sinatra would tell us yes well and here's the thing uh i haven't been married as long as you 35 years we did a uh recommitment i'm an old fart kevin i'm you're an old fart yeah we we did a uh we we reset our vows a couple years ago with uh, archbishop foley beach uh and boy, we screwed up marriage. We are. If you want a good example of a long-term marriage, we have that. If you want a good uh, example of people who learn from their mistakes, Jill and I, we, we nailed that. Uh, if you want a good example of two people who not, know how to hang wallpaper, we're not it. <laughs> Just no. <laughs> two people who can work together on DIY projects, DIY DIY projects in the house. We're not that, um, but we are a great example of holding into the long term of marriage. And no matter how much we screwed up, uh, we have come back to the fact that we're marriage, uh, married and we're thankful for that. Because in the end, that's one of the few things we all got. You know? And so, I don't know. I, I don't get this, Justin. Uh, it, I, 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 I'm asking for your resignation. I hate to do that as uh, a ministry leader at, here at Anglican TV. I don't want to be controversial, but uh, you are driving a Tesla, and you're the, the CEO of Ford. Shame on you. Yeah. Andrew Goddard, uh, who is uh, one of our friends, he's a very highly respected scholar in the UK, um, he's pointed out that Welby has misrepresented what has been decided and said about LLF and prayers for loving and love and faith. You know, Welby claims the House of Bishops sort of is where he is, but they have not said what Justin Welby has said. In fact, I'll read a quote from Andrew Goddard. It's one thing to reject the church's current teaching and engage in theological debate about an alternative. That's what's happening. People are saying, no, we need to change it. 
it's quite another to so directly misrepresent that teaching, which in fact recently has been reaffirmed, particularly if you're an archbishop. So Welby has basically is, has dissembled about what the church teaches, or he's trying to create facts on the ground and change things without going through anything. And uh, the Synod on Synodality, which is another story, one of the criticisms is that in this synodality stuff, no doesn't mean no. You you know if you know the the synod on synodality is, you know the Francis has said no to women clergy. Well, the synod has said okay, we'll continue to discuss it. You know, the, the Anglican Communion has said no to gay sex and all this and that and gay marriage and this and that. But the, the supporters will not take no for an answer, and we just keeps talking about and talking about and talking about, and eventually people just get worn out, or like, hey man, just do what you want to do, and let's talk about something else. Um, and Welby is, yeah, Welby's hey, Welby. I got a fun story. I can think of a fun story we can talk about. Uh, currently, the uh, the Catholic Church here has put forth a new character that uh, they want to reach the youth for. Some type of anime, blue eye, blue blue haired person in a hoodie. And uh, hey, they call her Luce or Lucy. I, what you know? Luce light. Uh huh. No, no, not light. Is that light? Yeah, that's Whatever. light in Italian. Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're uh, Latin too, but uh, oh my goodness, they're having. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is very unserious. This is very unserious to have. Yeah. Yes, just because you're having the world youth thing in Osaka, Japan, and they're sort of into anime there. Oh my goodness! But hey, well, who are we to who are we to throw stones at the Catholic Church? No, we can't. We we have. Ooh. We have Justin Welby, uh, oh, who doesn't oh. have blue hair, but he does. <laughs> he speaks you know, the zeitgeist. Have, he does look yeah. like a cartoon character. He mo- looks like Yertle the turtle with a very thin neck and all. That. He, yeah, the, he's our Dilbert, really. Um, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I I understand old clergy, white-haired people have a trouble reaching the youth, and they have a trouble reaching the youth because they think they have to change the message for the youth to hear it. And that's not the way the gospel works. Well, here's yeah. the funniest thing that, yeah. you know, the Episcopal Church is famous for always being behind the news cycle. Mm-hmm. So when somebody, so when they're debating in general convention, uh, transgenderism or something, it's society has already, already moved ba- beyond and rejected what they're reject, you know, doing. It's always, you know, late to the game. Why I mention this is that there have been a lot of recent studies that the new rising generation, what do they call it, Generation Z? Uh, Currently we're in Z. It's sad that we're at the end of the alphabet. This may be all over now, but we're at Z. And, uh, maybe it's double A after this. One. Yeah, but, <laughs> for the first time then they've been doing this, the new generation Men are more religious than women, mm-hmm. and they're more conservative in their theological outlook. Young people are looking into tr- at tradition, not rejecting it, but embracing it. If you, uh, you know, the, some of the engines driving the traditional Catholic movement, for instance, are young people. They've got young people. Um, it's the same in the cons- in the. Uh, uh, you go to Wheaton College and you see these young people. It, we remarked about Jeff Walden's paper on this, mm. uh, story on this. Mm. We've got young people coming into Anglicanism because they're seeking a traditional liturgical expression of their Christian faith. And what the Catholic Church with this anime character is doing is appealing to one or two generations that had passed by already and trying to be hip and with it <coughs> instead well, of... Uh, I've called the current history of, of imagery and artistry and symbolism. The church has, they come up with this McDonald's toy. They do. But in, in the same respect, I've called the current generation, generation cosplay. 
they think they can be anything and make up any character and be any gender and uh this is the catholic church trying to seek that this is the this is uh, a toy for generation cosplay brought to you by the roman catholic church you know i i don't get it um well how I, do you you know we're we're the church should teach young people to seek holiness yeah how does this plastic toy help you see holiness? How does it sort of, you know, what is, you know, look at the great artistry and icons and imagery and things that are used to sort of connect people to the divine. Is this blue plastic toy? I mean, it's as close closer to, to what the, the Paris, Paris Olympics, Olympics, the blue <laughs> smurf Dionysian <laughs> Eucharist. Well, if you, if you look close, there is a cross um they got green boots i don't know if that's what she is holding if that that's not a, a bishop's uh sphere staff. i don't a staff of some sort yeah i i don't i maybe we're just old fogies and we just don't get it george that must be it yeah don't know what we're doing all right let's move yeah, on to the least, next at least, the church, at least the lambeth conference didn't use rupert the bear or something yeah, that simple. Right. i mean you know but given the chance they would do something equally ass okay uh yep so brother 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 uh let's see next story here is story number three new charges of bullying have been filed against bishop and dyer um four out of five episcopal bishops call for her to resign we talked about this last week she says she's refusing to resign but now that these new allegations have come forward, she has back on vacation or sick leave. What, what's the d excuse this week? Ah, well, last week, uh -huh. as we let the story so far, I need to have an editorial in induction. And Dyer is the gift that keeps on giving Frank. Oh, yeah. You know, after a while, we just get sick of beating up on Justin Welby. Yeah. And we, or, or Francis, and we need to have something fun. This is going back to the good old days of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Um, Mm -hmm. Ann Dyer, uh, they dropped the legal process against her because it was too expensive and they just wanted to leave things lie. Four out of five bishops smoke lucky strikes and four out of five bishops say, go, Ann, we don't need you. We don't want you. Ann said, to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And she said she's returning to work. Then new charges were brought of uh, this conduct and bullying, and so she's now on sick leave. <clears throat> uh, it, it's yeah. funny, it, on her Facebook page, when she was, uh, man, I don't know, she's been in Italy on vacation, and when the news came, there's a picture of her sitting at a cantina holding up a glass of wine and smiling that she's been she looked like she was about to sit down with uh, Gretchen Whitmer and uh, Kamala Harris uh, for the sort of ladies' liquid lunch. Uh, but now she's on sick leave again. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. she has a cold. I don't know. cold. Yeah, it happens, you know. She's the... Uh, I, don't, I don't want to digress too far. We have a whole show to do. But um, you, if you're not going to hold your bishops accountable, this is what you're going to get. And... Uh, I, Here's the thing: if they want to make this stick, they're going to have to restart the whole process, mm -hmm. which means spending money. And she said she's not going on her own free will, so they canceled a process that could have ended things now. But now they're restarting, and it's going to cost them a few more hundred thousand pounds to get rid of her. So, you know, it's just a mess. You would it's think a, a you would think that a church that's been around for several hundred years would have a working legal process, but that's not true of the Episcopal Church. Why should it be true of the Scottish <laughs> Episcopal Church? Well, I think in the ACNA w w woke up to that really quick. I mean, uh, they had something in mind for what to do if they're going to uh, hold bishops accountable. But ooh, we better put this on paper because we're actually going to hold our bishops accountable. Uh, surprise, surprise. I think the ACNA has uh, held more bishops accountable in the last five years than the Episcopal Church in the last 30 or 40 years. You know, it, well, we've it, managed to expel a lot more bishops, but that that's not the same thing as being held accountable. That yes. just means picking on conservatives and kicking them out the door. <laughs> 
So because nobody ever held, you know, because well, actually, the liberals will say, well, we held Bill Love to being accountable to the general convention. So you know, you get an argument from a true believer on that one. Yeah. Okay idiots all right let's move on to the news here let's go here to our next story uh oh here okay story four before we get too far into this story we're going to talk about american politics uh if you're not into american politics uh you can tune out now but uh, i need to tell you up front anglican tv will not endorse a candidate this election cycle. Well, we've never endorsed a candidate. That's not who we are. But like so many of the great journalism periodicals here in America, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, um, list after list after list, we refuse to endorse a candidate because we want to remain neutral. George and I don't happen to be neutral. Uh, we have our opinions in politics, as you guys probably know. Uh, you probably know I have a great dis disdain and distaste for uh, former President Trump. And uh, um, I may have a greater disdain for Kamala Harris. If I have to vote this election, I'm able to do it because at one time in my youth, growing up with mom and dad, I used to have to eat a plate at least once every couple months of liver and onions. And because I was able to do that, it built in me that constitution of the character to be able to swallow things I just need, I know is good for me, and I'll, I'll do it. So, you know, well, that's that's my little forward here. George, let's talk a little about American politics. And I happen to like liver and onions. So, there you go. <laughs> you know. Still, the analogy's working pretty well. Uh, Kevin is choking it down. I don't mind. Can I have some more, please? Oh, and, gross. And, and I think you could extend that to the politics we've got right now. But continue, Kevin. I interrupted. No, no, no. So if Trump were elected, uh, it's going to, you know, for all intents and purposes, Trump has the momentum here in America. I don't think we can argue that any differently than um, Jimmy Carter coming up on... Uh, having Reagan come up. Jimmy Carter, the week before the election, was even in the polls. Okay, uh, The polling showed that uh, Jimmy Carter was up by two points uh, seven days before the election with Re Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan walked away with it in a landslide. There was just, he, there was just no momentum in the Jimmy Carter um, campaign. And boof, we got Reagan. Um, I think we're seeing that in a in a small sense here between uh, Kamala and uh, Donald, where she just doesn't have anything to sell on her record. All she can do is call uh, Donald uh, Hitler and the people who uh, will vote for him Nazis. That's, 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 her, that's the answer to every question she gets by the media. You know, get, tell us about your economic policy. Well, I'm not Hitler. <laughs> okay, so the, the, there exists that problem uh, where her campaign is kind of deflating. Um, and I watched a, a whole segment of CNN where they talked about, you know, kind of letting people know that there's a good chance here that Donald's going to walk away with it. Um, and we're warning you ahead of don't hate us, but, you know, we're warning you ahead of time. Politics is not what I remember when I was a kid. I don't remember this this vileness. Now, maybe I wasn't paying attention. You know, I, I remember reading some of the uh, stuff between Lincoln and Douglas um, back in the day, but I don't remember this. Well, historically, there have been presidents who've been vilified while in office and after office. Uh, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, I can remember as a small boy, uh, uh, the absolute hatred that some of the elites held for Richard Nixon, which when we now look in the back rearview mirror, we see Nixon um, and also the hatred for John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Here's remember, the funny yeah. thing. John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, his policies today are mainstream Donald Trump Republican policies. Richard Nixon a Democrat, a Republican, his policies today would be considered democratic. So, I mean, you know, the world is, the pendulum swings back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
but the, 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 they are pulling out all stops and they're pulling it out in an unusual way. A few weeks ago, I got an invitation. If I sent so much money, I'd be invited to meet with other pastors and religious leaders and I'd be on an exclusive group to meet Donald Trump. And, you know, how do they get my name? Well, I've done uh, some, uh, you know, I'm on the list for Governor DeSantis of of pastors, of his, you know, the, the politicians know who their influencers are on a local level, and I'm sure these are passed up to the national level at the time being. So if I sent a, so I sent some bucks, I could go get my picture taken. No, that's not what I'm going to do, or what I even should do, because mm -hmm. I don't think a pastor should take a public stance on individuals. He can take a, take a stance on issues, abortion, euthanasia. I think you should speak, but. Fred Smith, John Jones, no, I don't think you should do that. But it's really an unusual race. One of the things that, for our English viewers, you, you need to realize that if Donald Trump wins, he's going to hammer the labor government oh, harder than they've been yeah. handed in the generation. Yeah. Labor has sent activists to campaign for Harris. Um, labor is seeking to cancel labor has been working with some ngos in britain to cancel elon musk and twitter they're working with the eu to take down apple um you have to remember that if you're a friend of donald trump he looks after his friends he protects you yeah. tim, cook, tim cook just sat tim cook a gay man who has been back in the democrats has sat down with donald trump and but he's now on board elon musk of course is totally on board and if you go after Twitter, if you go after Apple, those are American companies. And by gosh, uh, Donald Trump's going to go after you. Yeah. Jamie Dimon, you know, uh, is on board. I mean, uh, it is amazing how much people know how bad the last four years have been. But one of the things we have here in America is the same problem they have in uh, the UK, and that is an absolute horrid press. The, the press here in America is, and even Fox News, yeah, there, there is very few conservative or neutral press outlets out there. Uh, that uh, the latest polling showed that 85% of stories are negative Trump, and 75% stories are uh, political stories are pro Harris. There, there's just no neutral balance at all. If you ask the mainstream media, Trump is Hitler and his supporters are Nazis. That's that's what they're going for here. And you know, I I can't say we I, I can't say we've ever had a neutral press, but I, it's never been this bad in my opinion. And the the reason why is the problem. We've always had propagandists. Mm -hmm. And there will always be propagandists, people pushing a particular side and shading things. But we in the United States and in other western countries you know, have had a model up until recently that the press would seek to present the truth, all the news that's fit to print, uh, not just the news that we like. Um, here's a, you know, a few months ago, the bishops from province for the Episcopal Church put out a letter denouncing Donald Trump for his racism, for his comments on immigrants. And this was a talking point put out by the press and the Democratic Party that Donald Trump had they said that, you know, immigrants were begging for bad blood into the United States. And so this allowed the province for bishops to wax lyrical on racism and this and that. Problem was Trump was taken out of context. That's not what he was saying. That's not what he meant. He's talking about these criminals crossing the border are poisoning America by their violence and activities. He wasn't talking about Mexicans as Mexicans. He was talking about criminals from Mexico, Venezuela, Nicaragua, El Salvador, that the criminals, not the people. And here's the funny thing, you know, the latest uh, polls show that Trump is doing very well among Hispanics. He's doing very well among African-American men. Muslims. <laughs> Muslims. You know, Trump is anti-Muslim. Well, all these Muslim leaders in Michigan where there's where there had been immigration from the Middle East are backing Trump. 
they don't buy the racism lies being spread about Trump. And Trump's problem is it, it's, you know, if he moderated his language, they wouldn't be able to take his sentences out of context and they wouldn't have, uh, well, you know, like, you, you, Kevin, you're right. I mean, when we were younger, I don't remember Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter saying that, you know, the other person is a is a shit vice president. Uh, Donald Trump said, you know, Kamala Harris is a shit vice president. Now, that prompted MSNBC to do a fact check. No, Kamala Harris is not composed of fecal matter. She is a human being. Um, but but he, you know, we're but, in a different age, different different ways of talking. And I we know if you've got half a brain, you know what Trump is saying. Mm -hmm. But we, you and I wouldn't want to talk that way or we wouldn't want our children to talk that way. But hey, that's well, where we are in the country. Now, people are wondering why Trump, who when he left office, his popularity was 19 percent. I mean, it, it was he was not popular. Uh, it was a bad time. Uh, he lost the election. He uh, indicated that uh, it was uh, fraud that uh, he lost the election. Um, I, I we're not going to debate that. It to be fraud. He didn't yeah, he, say he, that. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so it was just a bad time, and he left office and horrible per, uh, popular at the time. How does he come back? Well, I believe he was able to come back because he was deplatformed by Twitter. He spent a enormous a lot. Of, in an enormous amount of time on Twitter tweeting his thoughts. And his thoughts were uh, some taken out of context, some were in context. And I think uh, the American people uh, in November of 2020 uh, said, Ugh, or it was 2023, um, said, I just can't take it anymore. And uh, it, it's, the, it's time for a change, and, and they voted for a change. He was deplatformed, and we don't have a uh, a dribble barrage every night of what Trump said yesterday. I, I haven't read a Trump tweet. I, yeah, I haven't. I've not read a Trump tweet in four years, and he has his own. He has his own Twitter now, and the press doesn't want to send anybody to that, so they don't talk about what he said on his own Twitter. So, well, Kevin, it takes us back to the liver and onions. It's still <laughs> good for you. You just don't like it. I find Trump amusing. I find him entertaining. He's, sure. I think he's a funny fellow. He, uh -huh. I believe he is one of the best comedy writers I've ever seen. And I'm, in other words, the stuff he writes, uh, there's something, I learned this a long time ago when I started writing for professionally. Editors love a voice where when you read an article, you don't need to know whose name is on it, because you read it, you know that's from that guy. Sure. Because their voice comes through. Donald Trump has one of the purest, cleanest voice. It's, he's immediately recognizable on these tweets. Now, I'm not saying that he's an artist at, at crafting haikus or whatever, but what I am saying is that he's good at what he does, and he appeals to a certain demographic. And he, and frankly, I like what he writes. I may not agree with him. I don't agree with some of his policies. But I don't have the revulsion that some people have. Maybe uh, there's something wrong with me that I'm not picking up stuff. But no, oh, that yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's our our uh, ten minutes of politics here. You, you don't watch us for politics, but we have our political opinions, and it's a big story that's going to be an international story. And it's big in terms uh, of Anglican TV and Anglicans because the platform that uh, Donald ran on before as a Republican was uh, anti-abortion, pro-life. That was part of the Republican uh, platform. That's not there anymore. Um, they, they are now... Now it's free speech. You now it's free speech or states' rights is what we'd say. Donald Trump believes uh, abortion should be decided at a state level. Um, yeah, uh, so, w oh, here's the big thing. Did you see Christianity Today? Christianity Today um, said maybe we shouldn't vote this election. Well, Christianity Today long ago lost its ways. Yes. It began when they fired me about 15 years ago. <laughs> was that uh, it? <laughs> well, they wouldn't take my stories anymore because I was too conservative. They wouldn't take my stories anymore. And, well... There's a thing in America called Big Evo, 
which is sort of the evangelical elite types. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have been captured by Washington. Oh, and absolutely. And Russell Moore. And, uh, yeah. I'll stop. I don't want to. That's them. We're us. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. All right. Let's. We, yeah, we talked enough politics. I'm inspired little... by everybody, Kevin. Don't worry. <laughs> Living Church, Washington uh, Post, uh, Christianity Today. Yeah. The only people who take my stuff anymore are Jerusalem Post and Anglican Inc. <laughs> Well, hold on. You're the boss at Anglican. Good for you. That's why right. I take it, yes. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, Synod on Synodality concludes in Rome. Uh, big headline is, instead of waiting six months to write his own decision, Francis endorsed the Synod documents on the spot. Yes, Francis uh, surprised everybody, and he does that a lot. Now... The dumpster fire in the religious world, there are two of them right now. One is the Church of England, and one is the Roman Catholic Church. Well, guys, you're American. Why do you talk about the, these foreigners and everything? That's where the action is, friends. Um, the, the dumpster fire had been the United States for years, and then it burned itself out. Anglican Church in North America is doing just fine, thank you. Episcopal mm -hmm. Church is doing its thing. But the fire is burning in England and is burning in Rome. And this synodal document is leaves the door open to women's ordination. It leaves the door open to the devolution of doctrine to bishops and national conferences. It even opens the door for a new liturgy to replace the current new liturgy. A new liturgy that is more in tune with the spirit of the age. So how the Vatican blob interprets these things will have a tremendous effect on the Catholic Church. And every time the Catholic Church catches the cold, the Christian world gets the flu because that's, they're the tail that wags the rest of the Christian world's dog. Is that a good analogy? Yeah. Nah, that's all right. So they, um, but when got, but instead of ruminating on what the synod wrote, Francis just rubber stamped which was unusual for Francis, because he likes to take his own thing. But here's a little tiny thing. It's not related to the Synod, but on the anniversary of the, uh, the apparition of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is a post-Reformation Catholic uh, piety about the heart of Jesus appearing to St. Mary, Margaret, something or other. You know, it's very nice, but if you go dive deep enough, you see it about paragraph 130, sort of towards the middle of the end, it says, you don't actually have to believe this happened. You just have to respect the belief that others believe that it happened, or words to that effect. So Sounds like a this, Andy, Andrew Stolle, Stanley. <laughs> it, deep in this, yes, yeah. yes. We're getting, deep, you know, the relativism that is crushing the Anglican world is threatening the Catholic world, is being stapled on, you know, to other things as well. So the apparition of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, believing in the mystery, the, I think it's the 12 mysteries or That's whatever it, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to believe that now. You don't, it, it's, you know, even though it's been part of the Catholic tradition, you go to most parishes, there's a picture of Jesus pointing at his heart, all this and that. They've now adopted an Anglican worldview, which is, hey, if it works for you, great. I hate to be that flippant, but that's, but when the Catholic Church is doing that, if it works for you, that's great. You're removing sort of the backstop of a magisterium. And our problem in the Anglican world is that we had a magisterium, which was sort of the consensus of belief. But because of the activism and the, the and the pushing of anthropology above everything else over the last two generations, we've lost that in the Anglican world. Now the Catholics are set to lose that as well. Yeah. Which is cool because we always need new stories and Anglican unscripted, and I think uh, we're going to just be basically reporting Roman All Catholic Francis and Anne Dyer for the uh... <laughs> yeah, near future. All right, so uh, lo and behold, uh, now it's a tragedy when a child learns that his parents aren't who they thought they were. Um, I can't think of anything. Uh, more horrifying than growing up and learning that your father wasn't your father or your mother wasn't your mother, that does something to you. 
Um, I don't have that experience, but I can imagine just that that trust you've had in your mind, that certainty you've had in your mind for years, that this man is your father, and you find out he wasn't because mom had an affair. That oh ooh, I can't. Uh, I just that that would that would certainly change me. Uh, and I think it changed Justin Welby. He has announced that uh, um, some time ago that his mom had an affair, and he is the product of that affair, and the person he thought was his father is not his father. Ouch. Okay, that, you know, that, that would haunt me. Now we're going to take that a step further. He has now said, by the way, my biological father happened to own slaves some time ago, and oh, am I sorry for that. Six generations ago. Six generations ago, um, the the the, uh, the ancestry of his father had a slave owner in it, and uh, Justin is taking the upon himself to bear that guilt. Once again, that's completely unbiblical uh, it, for any person who's confessed sin. But maybe he's never confessed sin. I don't know. Let, let's talk about this, George. Is he guilty for his father's uh, sin? No, it's quite clear in Scripture. The sins yeah. of the fathers are not revisited on the sons. Yeah. What did this man do? What did his parents do for this Two man to be born blind? Yeah. We, we stand before Christ as individuals. We don't stand uh, as members of a tribe or members of a clan. So the sins of other people have no bearing upon our own lives, uh, our own salvation. And second, the whole reparations thing is historically inaccurate. Britain freed the slaves. Britain spent during the this period 1.6% of its GDP on fighting the slave trade, policing the West African coast. Several thousand British sailors died of diseases off the coast of Africa, fighting the slave trade. And for Britain now to feel guilty, it's like, you know, the British liberated Belson concentration camp. And now they should, they are being asked to pay reparations for what the Nazis did at Belson. That's the analogy I, in my mind. Yeah. Now, this Britons freed them. They didn't cause this. Now, why is this? First off, why does Welby have this exhibitionist desire, this narcissistic desire to take the worst aspects of his personal life, his mother's infidelity to her, his father, because his parents separated and he was raised by his father. He was rejected by his mother. And now his, bio, his legal father um, is not his father. And I mean, we're getting into daytime television dramatics here. I mean, of being screwed up. You know, he, he's basically flagellating himself once again. Coincidentally, his mother just left him a year or two ago, 2.1 million pounds. So if he wants to make reparations, he's got the money to do it. Yeah, now's your time. But, but why does this matter? Well, day or two before the start of the Commonwealth had a government's meeting in Samoa, Welby releases his state. Welby's been pushing the reparations. He's been encouraging the West Indian nations to think that they're going to get money out of Britain. He's said, oh, the Church of England's going to give you 100 million pounds. Maybe we can even mark it up to a billion pounds. And the British government should do the same. Well, the British government said, too, so we're not touching that. And the Caribbean nations wanted reparations to be on the agenda. At the Commonwealth Head of Governance meeting, uh, British Foreign Secretary said, nope. And a day or two before the start, Welby, who is legally the number two person in Britain after the Queen, the Archbishop of Canterbury, okay. in the high precedence, okay. has basically moved to the left of the Labour government on this issue and undermining his own Prime Minister. And all this is going on while there's a move to remove the bishops from the House of Lords. Well, if I were the British Prime Minister and I'm under attack from Donald Trump on the right and Justin Welby on the left, and I can hammer Justin Welby and I can't touch Trump, I'm going to hammer Welby and allow the Lords to be kicked out of the bishops out of Lords. But Welby is actually politically interfering again in a way that embarrasses the government. Well, he would do this with the, uh, the, the conservative government over the Rwanda policy towards, you know, we'll ship uh, illegal immigrants to Rwanda to be vetted. Oh, what a terrible place Rwanda is. 
Rwanda is actually cleaner and nicer. Kigali is a nicer place than London if you want cleanliness and safety to be your guides. Yeah. But I'll leave it there. <sighs> hey, George, we've come to the end of our stories. Good. <laughs> Once again, I'm going to be uh, live streaming the uh, uh, installation of the new Archbishop, the ACNA, uh, Steve Wood. Uh, look for that to occur Wednesday. Uh, show up on the uh, YouTube channel a little earlier, but I'll send out an announcement on an official announcement like an hour before the uh, um, the installation. So be ready for that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 888 of Anglican. <laughs>